Hi, this is Saqib Rahman from Orthoclips. And this podcast is on fractures from firearm injuries, top 10 misconceptions. So I'm going to be talking about civilian firearm injuries, not wartime injuries or injuries on the battlefield from military weapons, but the kind of injuries that we see coming into our trauma centers, uh, particularly in urban areas. So number one misconception, gunshot fractures can all be treated similarly. Well, that's not true. Uh, and, you know, you can have low velocity gunshot injuries, you can have high velocity gunshot injuries. Um, so a simple handgun injury uh, is going to be very different than uh, being shot by a high powered rifle, for instance, with the degree of soft tissue injury. Um, and uh, wound management could be very different. Uh, so just keep in mind, if you hear that you're being asked to treat with treat a patient with a gunshot injury, um, they don't all necessarily look the same. Number two, fractures from gunshot injuries are not open fractures. Now, this is interesting because I hear this sometimes from uh, other doctors who've seen a lot of these uh, injuries, especially low velocity handgun injuries uh, being treated without urgent debridement. And that's a common practice, and many centers do that. And we don't have the greatest data to support that practice, but it is common that low-velocity gunshot fractures don't all go to the OR. But they're open fractures. Don't say they're not open fractures. You have to recognize it's an open fracture that maybe you are treating differently. Uh, that said, what's the most important thing with an open fracture? It's give antibiotics. So you got to give them antibiotics. And then whether or not you have to do an urgent surgical debridement depends on other things. That brings me to number three. Fractures from gunshot injuries do not require surgical debridement. Well, I just uh, explained that uh, frequently they don't. So a lot of low-velocity handgun injuries may not require surgical debridement. But if you have a high-velocity injury, yes, you may need surgical debridement. If you have a low-velocity injury but there's exposed bone, you can take the dressings down. There's a three-centimeter wound and you're looking at the fracture. Don't you think that requires a surgical debridement? It probably does. Um, because if a patient came in with blunt trauma and a three centimeter open wound with a fracture exposed, you'd probably be doing surgical debridement. So, um, so you know, it, they're, they don't always get treated non-surgically uh, from a debridement standpoint. Number four, um, Fractures from gunshot injuries uh, require operative fixation. So a lot of, this is not something I see said that often, but it is a little bit of a misconception. Um, you'll oftentimes look at, um, you know, gunshot fractures. You have some bullet wounds. You have sometimes a pretty comminuted fracture, and the thought is, oh, geez, that looks terrible, and we're going to have to operate on that. Um, there are many fractures that can be treated like closed injuries, uh, so if you have, for instance, a humeral shaft fracture with low uh, velocity handgun injury, small entry and exit wounds, the wounds are somewhat remote from the fracture. That is that you're not looking at the fracture site uh, through the wound. Um, many of these can be treated uh, non-surgically um, and uh, the indications are not terribly different than they are for closed fractures. Okay, number five misconception, that the heat from the bullet sterilizes the wound. Now, this is an interesting thing. I've heard some people say this, that, um, well, uh, the wound becomes sterile because it almost gets cauterized by the bullet. So that's never really been proven to be true. Uh, and if you have ever seen gunshot wound uh, get infected, uh, I think that would give you pause uh, to come to that conclusion. So uh, no, the bullet uh, does not necessarily sterilize the wound or the tract uh, involved from the uh, path of the bullet through the soft tissues. Number six, that you have to initial the bullet with an instrument when you take it out of a patient surgically. Now, this may sound weird to some of you, but I can tell you where I trained 
uh, this was being done and there was this uh, notion and I've talked, uh, I've spoken with um, um, forensics uh, people at the police department and they cringe when they hear this and they've seen this and they don't know why this practice is out there. But somehow there's this, con- there's this misconception that when you take the bullet out, you're supposed to scratch your initials as a surgeon uh, who removed the bullet. Well, if there's going to be any ballistics, uh, forensics investigation on that uh, bullet for that particular uh, case, if, assuming it's a criminal case, you've kind of ruined that. Uh, I don't know where this comes from. Uh, I've been told that this is absolutely a misconception. If someone wants to know who took the bullet out, all they have to do is look at the operative report. So don't do that. Number seven, uh, misconception, that you can identify the caliber of bullet and the type of weapon um, from x-rays. So you have to be really careful with this. Um, You may see and treat a lot of these. You may have... uh, significant knowledge. Uh, Maybe you own a firearm. Uh, Maybe you you, um, consider yourself an expert. Most of us are not experts and we most most of us are certainly not forensics uh, uh, experts. We're not forensic pathologists. We're not medical examiners. Um, You know, if you're an orthopedic surgeon, uh, you may certainly want to look at the x-rays to recognize is this... um, uh, fully jacketed um, ammunition? Uh, is there flower peddling uh, of the uh, bullet to indicate some type of hollow point? And uh, perhaps uh, you may draw some inference as to the degree of soft tissue injury from that. Um, but you really shouldn't comment, especially not in the medical record, uh, that uh, this appears to be a uh, such and such type of bullet, and we believe that this was uh, probably from this type of weapon. Um, Treat the wounds, treat the patient. Uh, You can use a little bit of that information to help guide you, but do not draw definitive conclusions. Leave that to the uh, forensic pathologists. So that kind of leads us to uh, the number eight uh, misconception, which is that you can clearly identify entry and exit wounds. Um, you know, there are cases where it's helpful to deduce this clinically. For instance, a um, patient has um, transabdominal injury involving the large uh, intestine and has a fracture associated with that. And you want to know, well, did the bullet hit the, you know, hit the bone first and then go through the uh, large uh, intestine? Or was it the other way around? Because I would presume that, uh, uh, at least intuitively, that a bullet passing through the large intestine and then coming into the bone, or the hip joint for that matter, uh, potentially could be much more contaminated than the other way around. Um, But the fact is, you can be fooled by entry and exit wounds. Um, The... uh, you know, the conclusions that uh, surgeons make sometimes are wrong. You think one's an, one's an entrance wound and the other's the exit wound um, because of the pattern of injury. Uh, it's not always that consistent. There can be a lot of uh, tumble of a projectile before it enters the body uh, and uh, or vice versa. Um, as it's passing through the soft tissues, it can potentially create a much larger exit wound, which is frequently the case, but not consistently. So, Be careful uh, with drawing definitive conclusions about entry and exit wounds. Number nine misconception, that uh, the wounds themselves uh, clearly uh, indicate the severity of soft tissue injury. So what I mean by that is, for example, you can have a patient with pretty small uh, bullet wounds and have a significant tract of uh, soft tissue injury. So for instance... You know, the projectile uh, enters, creating a very small wound, and there's a lot of uh, tumble. And um, what I mean by that is that the projectile sort of turns sideways, hits the bone, 
other fragments create additional soft tissue injury. Um, the projectile itself continues to tumble exits, perhaps in such a way that it creates a small exit wound. So the wounds themselves look small, but the tract of injury to the soft tissues can be significant. So um, you do have to be a little bit careful with that, uh, and you still have to uh, have an index of suspicion, uh, potentially based on uh, patient symptoms, swelling, uh, early signs of compartment syndrome, um, maybe fracture pattern, uh, that uh, perhaps this is a worse injury than you can tell from just the size of the entry and exit wounds. So be careful with that. And number 10 of our top 10 misconceptions about fractures from firearm injuries is that the person who got shot must have done something wrong. And the reason I say that is because, sure, that is often the case, uh, if you're out late at night um, and uh, you get shot, sure, maybe you were involved in something uh, and up to no good and got shot, but um, you don't know as the treating surgeon. And to start off with that premise, I think, is uh, not necessarily fair to the patient. Um, it kind of puts you in a mindset in which um, you think that uh, maybe this uh, patient um, got themselves into trouble. And of course, that could be the case in many instances, but it can certainly be the case that a person literally was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Uh, if you live in certain uh, neighborhoods that uh, uh, in which firearms are uh, prevalent, uh, you literally could be sitting in your home and have a bullet uh, bullet come right through the window or through the wall and uh, you literally were just minding your own business, and that happened to you. So, uh, you know, I'd hate to be uh, uh, a person coming into a hospital who's just been assaulted and to sort of um, have someone have the misconception that uh, I obviously did something wrong because I got shot. So, so those are our uh, top 10 uh, misconceptions about fry, uh, fractures from firearm injuries. Uh, I hope that helps if you come across these. Uh, thanks, and uh, be sure to leave your comments or um, uh, questions, and um, see you on the next podcast.